attendance. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker this evening, uh, who is George Webster. Uh, George Webster's first race uh, was at Edenvale, Ontario in 1956. Uh, since then, he has attended countless races at over 80 different places uh, and a similar number of F1 races. Uh, in those formative years of the Canadian Grand Prix, uh, Webster attended almost every one as a spectator, a track worker, uh, and as an F1 steward. He morphed from race official to a race photographer slash writer. Uh, he has written many publications, written for many publications, including Autosport Canada and Performance Racing News. So George really knows his stuff here, uh, and I really appreciate him uh, joining us this evening. And uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to you, George. And uh, you have a lot of great images to get through, so take it away. Okay. So, welcome to my talk on the early years of the Canadian Grand Prix. Before we get underway, a few introductory remarks. Tonight's presentation is a kind of a rerun of the one I prepared in 2017, the, which was the 50th anniversary of the first Canadian Grand Prix. Since then, there have only been two Canadian Grand Prix held in 2018 and 20, 2019, because the next two were canceled due to COVID. So, while this is a repeat of that 2017 talk, it may have a number of references to the 50th anniversary, the story of the early years of the Grand Prix, and the role that most sport played. It's still worth telling. Next. So the first Grand Prix of Canada was held in 1967, and this is the program cover. In 27, 2017, it was the 50th anniversary, but only the 48th running of the event due to the cancellations. It was canceled five times in, in total up to now, 75, 87, 2009, two, and then the last two years, 2020 and 2021. Cancellation was threat, threatened at least twice more, 2004, because of the tobacco sponsorship issue, and in 2017, uh, over a dispute over uh, them being pregnant, the F1 pressuring uh, the Montreal organizers to upgrade their track. Um, in fact, the race has uh, not been held in, since, given that the race has not been held in three different years, the 50th Grand Prix was actually the race held in 2019, and that's the most recent one. So, the Canadian Post Office recognized the 50th anniversary with a commemorative set of stamps honoring five GP winners, uh, all except for Gilles. The other four were multiple winners of the Canadian event. Uh, Jackie Stewart won twice, Gilles Villeneuve once, Eric Senna twice, uh, Schumacher seven times, and Lewis Hamilton four times. There were other multiple GP winners not recognized on the stamps. Next. So I attended the first GP in 1967, and I was also at the 48th running of the event in 2017, and again in 2019. I attended all eight GPs at Mosport, and the next six at Montreal, and a lot since then. And all, I have attended over 70 Grand Prix here and in Europe. Next. So there's no other annual sporting event of any kind in Canada, which has such an international reach. If you think of the Grey Cup or the Stanley Cup or the Briar, they're important Canadian events, but they don't have the same international status. As for other race events in Canada, nearly all the major race events are visiting rounds of American-based series, none of which compare to the Canadian Grand Prix. By contrast, in the United States, the USGP is a bit overshadowed by other famous events there, the Indy 500, Daytona 500, the 24 hours of Daytona, 12 hours of Sebring and so on. Next. So what do you remember from that first year of the Canadian Grand Prix, 1967? Here are some things that come to mind. It was Canada's centennial year. Take note of this logo of the centennial year. You'll see it again. Next. Of course, we all remember Expo 67, which was staged on two islands, one built for the event in the St. Lawrence River at Montreal. And we'll see that again. Next. As for Toronto, the Maple Leafs won the Stanley Cup that year, something I've not been able to repeat in all the years since. Next. 
Beatles released their album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts and Club Band. In movies, it was Dustin Hoffman and The Graduate, Clint Eastwood and A Fistful of Dollars. On television, the Smothers Brothers were big. And on Broadway, they had Cabaret and Hair. Next. Most, more significantly, in our context here, the movie Grand Prix was released late in 1966. It was in Cinerama, which is similar to IMAX, and it featured amazing in-car racing footage, unlike anything we'd ever seen before. Uh, it introduced the general public to Grand Prix racing, the circuits, the cars, and the drivers, some fictional, some real. Next. So when the Grand Prix came to Mosport in 1967, there was already a ready built, well-informed fan, fan base in place here. British sports cars and their more humble economy sedans were very popular, and we lusted for the more expensive makes like Porsche, Jaguar, and Mercedes. This was the foundation of the so-called sports car movement here. And Formula One is really seen as part of the sports car movement. Next. The number of sports car clubs was exploding. The Canadian Automobile Sports Clubs, CASC, was a federation formed of member clubs across the country, especially in Ontario and Quebec. It was the national authority governing all sports car competition in Canada. CASC affiliated clubs had organized sports car races on the runways of former World War II air training bases beginning in the 1950s. Well, there were at least five different airfield circuits that operated in Ontario in the Primo Sport area. Next. We got our news from magazines like Canada Track and Traffic and Road and Track, even though their long lead times meant that the racing news was pretty stale by the time we got it. There were weekly papers like the American Competition Press and the English Motoring News, but few Canadians read either one. Companies like Castro, Shell, and BP produced racing films which the clubs would borrow to show at their meetings. There was very limited television coverage of car racing in that time. The recent invasion of the Indy 500 by F1 stars like Jack Brabham, Jim Clark, Dan Gurney, Graham Hill, and Jackie Stewart had given these drivers much more visibility. The US Grand Prix had been running at Watkins Glen since 1961, and many Toronto area sports car fans made an annual pilgrimage to the Glen for this event. Hence, we knew a lot about the recent history of sports car racing in Formula One, but we may not have been too up to date on the current events of Formula One. Next. With the large immigrant population, especially in Toronto, Montreal, we had a built-in fan base of post-war arrivals from Britain, Germany, and especially Italy. At most sport, there had been professional races since it opened in 1961, the Players 200 and the Sports Car Canadian Grand Prix each year. At saint Javit, as we called Montreblanc at that time, they also ran professional sports car races. In 1966, both circuits hosted rounds of the fledgling Can-Am series. Next. Gerald Donaldson, who became Canada's premier Formula One writer, wrote a definitive history of the early years of the Canadian Grand Prix. I found his book to be a valuable resource. The photos I'm using today have been scanned from contemporary publications. Many of these photos are credited to Lionel Birnbaum. Also, my thanks to Bill Green at, at the uh, Research Center in Watkins Glen for the use of his program collection. I've used a lot of program uh, covers to illustrate this. Next. So by 1967, we were welcome, ready to welcome a proper Formula One Grand Prix to Canada. Earlier in the decade, there have been one or two unsuccessful attempts to get a Formula One race in Canada. But the 1967 event was the first, it was approved as a one-off event in recognition of our centennial year. Uh, a bit on the governance here. The FIA is set up as the sole governing body of all motorsports competition in the world. The FIA recognizes a local national sporting authority or ASN in, based on the French name in each country and delegates its control of racing to their respective ASNs. The CASC was not an ASN and at that time, and it governed motor sports car racing under the authority of the British ASN, the Royal Automobile Club. This was the formal arrangement for FI approval of the 1967 Canadian Grand Prix, 
making effectively a second British Grand Prix, an exception to the rule of one championship GP per, per country. Both Mosport and Sangevit wanted the event, but it went to Mosport in 1967. So here's the map of Mosport. It's an attempt to give it a three-dimensional use. This is a very familiar uh, map. Next, here's a more accurate, flat, two-dimensional map. The track layout is essentially unchanged from this today. Next. So here's the starting lineup for the 1967 race. There were 18 entries in all, but only 14 Formula One regulars, and fewer had proper three-liter engines as allowed by the new 1966 rules. The Lotus 49 was new that year, and it debuted at Zandvoort a few weeks earlier with the new Cosworth Ford DFD engine. Won the pole and it won the race. This engine was to revolutionize and dominate F1 racing for the next several years. But I doubt that many people at most sport at the time had any concept of how significant this engine was going to be, even though these cars proved to be fastest in qualifying. The other potential winner was the Brabham Repco, a light car with a reliable stock block V8 engine, which had taken Brabham to the championship in 1966. Others like Ferrari, Maserati and BRM had gone down the wrong track, building big, heavy and often reliable, unreliable engines. The rest in the main were using bored out engines from the previous one and a half liter rules or the even older two and a half liter engines uh, from that date back to 1960. Next. So here's a picture of the starting grid. That's Brabham uh, in the front row there. And uh, Gurney over his shoulder. Next. So here's the start. Uh, notice the spray. I'm going to go on a bit about the the way marshals uh, stood right on the side of the track, uh, exposing themselves to danger, something that we, we think un, un, inconceivable today. It's obviously very dangerous. Next. So here's some more pictures. The upper, uh, you can see with the rain, the upper one shows a gurney, uh, I think leading the Lotus. And the bottom one, it's Brabham who won the race. The two Lotus team cars were the fastest, but they had troubles, notably the ignition short out when the rain came down. And the Brabham's, which were on Goodyear's rather than the standard Dunlop racing tires, had better pace when the surface was wet. In the second half of the race, the rain came down pretty heavily. Drivers made pit stops for dry goggles. The Lotus cars drowned out. Next. Only Jack Brabham had a relatively uneventful day and he cruised home to the win by a margin of more than a full minute over his teammate, Denny Holm, the only other driver to finish all 90 laps. Once again, here's a flagman standing on the track, ex totally exposed to danger. Now, somebody has been asking who that is. I think it's Wally Branson. That's the way I remember it. Next. So here's the results. Only 12 finishers, uh, Brabham the winner and his teammate home, uh, the, the other car in the lead lap. The best result for a Canadian driver went to Al Pease who completed only 47 laps. Um, Pease's results in the, in the couple of Grand Prix that he ran were pretty disappointing. And so as internationally, he, he has suffers from a bad reputation, although we recognize them as, as one of our leading drivers here in, in Ontario. It, this may not have been a class race by any measure, but it was our Grand Prix and our first F1 Grand Prix, and that makes it iconic in the history of Canadian motorsport. Next. Here's Jack Brabham getting the trophy. Notice the Centennial logo. Bob Hanna on the right was one of the key figures in making this event a success and he continued to play a key role at CASC's executive director until it's in CASC's unfortunate demise in 1987. Next. So after the success of the 1967 event, the FIA granted CASC full ASN status in its own right. 
and with it the right to stage an annual Grand Prix as a Canadian sanctioned event. In this area of rapprochement between the English and French communities in Canada, a decision was made to alternate the Grand Prix between Quebec and Ontario in alternate years. Next. So, 1968 Grand Prix went to saint Javit. It had hosted the first Can-Am race in 1966. Notice that they recycled the artwork for the program from the year before. The official name of this track, by the way, was Le Cirque Montreblanc saint Javit. Uh, so we usually called it saint Javit or Le Cirque. Next, there's the track. Uh, this track had limited space in the paddock, limited space in the pits, and limited vantage spots for the spectators. More importantly, there was the road coming up from Montreal was just two lanes. Next. So in practice, Jackie East in his Ferrari crashed and he broke his leg. Next. Uh, here's Prime Minister, then Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, who flew in from a helicopter and he waved the flag to start the race and he stayed to the end of the race. He was quite a car enthusiast. Next. So there's the start of the race, two different pictures of it. Uh, notice that these cars had the high wings uh, that were uh, uh, seen in F1 for a short period of time. This is the only time we saw them with the high wings in Canada. So Yoke and Rin started from the pole in a Brabham Repco. Chris Amon in a Ferrari led the first 72 laps, but the 1967 champion, Denny Holm, shown here, starting from the third row, was the winner in a McLaren Ford. Next. So 1970, after a year back at Mosport, the GP returned to Le Cirque, where the new Tyrrell Ford 001 was much anticipated, as seen in this cover artwork. We'd never seen any pictures up to that point. This was a drawing anticipating the appearance of the, of the, of the car for the first time at saint should be next. So here's an overview of the front stretch and the pits and paddock from Namoro Corner. Maybe you get us some sense of how uh, limited the space is. Next. So George Eaton, a sign of the Eaton department store family, Canada's largest department store, bought a ride with BRM for a season and a bit with limited success. He finished in 10th here, his best ever resort, result in F1. In later years, we had two Canadian drivers who were F1 stars, Gilles Villeneuve and his son, Jacques. By the way, we currently have two Canadian drivers in F1, Lance Stroll and Nicholas Latifi. In all, 15 different Canadians, including Peter Ryan, who is really an American who lived at Montreblanc, have participated in F1 racing. Next. Here's Jackie Stewart in that new Tyrrell 001. He qualified in the pole, led the first 31 laps, motoring off into the distance. On lap 32 of the 90 laps, he retired with a broken front stub axle. He also retired in the, in the, in the next two Grand Prix that year that followed the USGP and the Mex Mexican G debut for that car. Next. Eeks, again in a Ferrari, Inherited the lead after Stewart retired, and he won the race by a 15-second margin over Clay Regazzoni in the other Ferrari. Chris Amon in a march was the only other driver to finish on the lead lap. Notice the theme here. Not too many cars finishing on the lead lap. Note that here, in 1970, players were still using the centennial theme trophy we saw back in 1967. Okay, so I call this era, the most sport years, 1969 through 1977. I should have said 1967 through 1977, with the exception of the two races at saint Juvie. Next. So under the plan of alternating the Grand Prix between most sport and Le Cirque, the GP returned to most sport for the 1979 event after the first GP in Quebec the year before. Jackie Eeks. Uh, won the pole in his Brabham Ford, while Jackie Stewart was fourth fastest in his Matra Ford. Eeks led from the start, but Stewart had caught him by lap five. 
and he took the lead on the next lap. After that, Eeks hounded Stewart. On lap 33 of 90, Eeks made an impossible move to duck inside Stewart over the crest into the second turn. They collided and the pocketer Stewart spun off and out of the race. Well, Eeks kept on going. So Eeks won the race by a margin of 36 seconds over Jack Brabham and the other Brabham team car. Jochen Rind in a Lowe's 49B was the only other driver to finish in the lead lap. So after this GP, uh, we had a year back at saint Javit for 1970, and then it came back to Mosport in 1971. Next. So 1971 back at Mosport after the year at saint Javit. Obviously, players like the program from the year before, because here it is again. The name Players Grand Prix Canada must have been an effort to produce a neutral name that would work in either language. I don't think they use apostrophes in French, but that's another matter. Next. The popular local driver, Wayne Kelly, was killed in an on-track accident during the Formula Ford race, which preceded the Grand Prix, when he came over the crest between corners one and two and ran into an ambulance parked on the track. So in that time, cars were slowed uh, for an accident by marshals waving one or two yellow flags, but that had proved ineffective with the speed bad drivers. Since then, it's become standard practice to use a pace car or a safety car to slow the field down to a more moderate and slower pace. The idea of the full course yellow behind the pace car was once scorned by diehard sports cars fans, but it has become accepted as an essential safety measure. This fatality created a long delay until the corner was dispatched and uh, performed its duties. By the time they were ready to start the GP, it had started raining. There was a delay of over two hours before the race got started in light rain. By lap 60 of 80, the rain had turned to fog and darkness uh, was approaching. The flag the race was flagged off after 64 laps. Stewart and Peterson had shared the lead, but Stewart led the final 33 laps to take the checker. Peterson was second in March, while Mark Donahue uh, in a Penske entered McLaren was third. Okay, I've got lost here. Okay, this was George Eaton's only start in 1971. He was classified as a 15th place finisher, five laps down in the race winner. So 1972, the CSC was simultaneously the governing body of Canadian motorsport and the promoter of the Grand Prix. Maybe a bit of a conflict there. They made the decision not to return to San Javier as originally planned. It had proven to be an unviable business proposition. Not enough spectators could get up that two lane road on the race day. So the Grand Prix found a permanent home at Mosport and came back here again in 1972. So the, here's the cover of the program. The bottom picture is the driver's meeting, which you can see were different in those days. They just stood outside the entrance to the control tower and anybody who wanted by could join in at the back. Maybe you're there. Here's another view of the same driver's meeting. Next. So the start was delayed by fog, a common occurrence at Mosport. At the start, Peterson, in a march, led Stewart, who started from the second row. It took Stewart three laps before he got passed for the lead and drove off into the distance to win the race. Peterson continued to drive in his dramatic style, but a collision with Graham Hill, who he was lapping, ended his day. Formula One rookie Peter Revson finished second in the Yardley McLaren, some 48 seconds back. His McLaren teammate home was third right behind him. That's uh, Stewart in the lower picture there. Next. So 1973. Next. So this was another wet start. Peter. Peterson and Revson were on the front row, but I was impressed by young Nicky Lauda's rocket-like start into the lead from the fourth row. 
He was on Firestone rain tires, like, unlike most of the others, mainly on Goodyear's. So this gave, us, gave me the idea that uh, Nicky Lauda was a future star. And then, of course, that turned out to be true. Next. So this is the pace car story. In the wake of some serious accidents in which there have been inadequate race rescue procedures, for example, Roger Williamson at Zandvoort earlier that year, Grand Prix officials for some time have been talking about adopting at the American practice of using full course yellows with a pace car in Grand Prix. And they had made a test run at an event earlier in the year. This time it came to pass. Schechter and Saver tried to run side by side down into turn two and Saver crashed out of the race. This was to be his final race because he was killed in practice for the USGP two weeks later. The accident with the service vehicles partly blocked the track. Uh, so they called out Epi Wheats is in the pace car. Unfortunately, this era of handmade lap charts, no one was quite sure who the leader was after most of the cars had already pitted to change off their rain tires. The pace car was told to pick up Howden Ganley, who for sure was not the leader. This let those on the light lap ahead of Ganley make up a lap unbeknownst to race control. Meanwhile, Emerson Fittipaldi was trapped behind Ganley. After the pace car was called in and the racing resumed, the confusion continued. Next. So at the end of the 80 laps, the scoreboard at the top showed the order as number one, Fittipaldi, number 25, Ganley, number eight, Revson, and number 20, Beltoise. Colin Chapman, believing Fittipaldi had won, as he, as he tended to do or often did, changed, charged out onto the track as Fittipaldi came around, but the checker was not shown. Finally, the starter waved the checker at the group of Ganley, Mike Halewood, Refson, and James Hunt, a different combination. They issued Fittipaldi, Jackie Oliver, and Revson to the podium, where they stood with bemused expressions on their face. And the winner's trophy, was handed to Revs in the middle there. Uh, that's uh, Fittipaldi to his, or to our left, and um, Oliver to our right. In the hours that followed, the um, lap scorers were able to recheck their work using the tapes that had been marked with the car numbers as they passed. It takes a few moments before the information that tapes is transferred to the actual lap chart but it is an accurate, a bit slow method. In the end, they verified that Revson was the race winner with Fittipaldi second and Oliver third, exactly the finishing order that the, had been represented by the podium awards. Beltoise was credited with fourth, but Ganley was sixth the lap down. It should be no surprise that the idea of using a pace car like this in F1 races was dropped and not revived again until 1993. 20 years later, in a time when computerized lap scoring had been long established. So the idea of using the safety car to slow the field of cars was a long time gaining acceptance in Formula One. But note that this race was the first ever that used uh, what they now call safety car. Next, there's Revson in his McLaren on the cover of Motorsport. Next, 1974. What happened there? Oh, here we go. Coming to Canada, the second last race of the season in 1974, Lauda, Schechter, Regazzoni, and Fittipaldi were all in contention for the championship. Fittipaldi started from the pole, but Lauda led every lap until he spun out of the lead on lap 68 of 80, letting Fittipaldi through to take the win. Two American cars made their debut in this most sport race, Mario Andretti in a Parnelli and Mark Donahue in a Penske. Okay, there we, there's the picture that goes with what I, what I what I said, just said, there's Pitt Donahue in the, in the uh, Penske at, at the top, and there's Fittipaldi in, 
in the uh, winner's circle with Regazzoni and Peterson. Oh, no, I'm wrong. Back up one. Um, okay, next. So here's the winner. Fittipaldi in the McLaren, Marlboro McLaren. He left your Titan Championship points with Regazzoni, who had finished in second place. Fittipaldi then finished eighth at Watkins Glen two weeks later, but it was good enough to give him the title. Next. So 1975 was problematic for most port. By now, Bernie Ecclestone, who was the owner of the Brabham team, had taken over contract negotiations on behalf of all the garages the so-called F1 CA. That's every team but Ferrari. In negotiations with both Mosport and Watkins Glen, Mosport failed to make an acceptable response before Bernie's self-imposed August 1st deadline. And so no contract for the 1975 race was signed. On the other hand, Watkins Glen had accepted Bernie's terms at the last moment and their 1975 GP was a goal. This was probably exactly what Bernie wanted. Most sports loss of the date was an object lesson to all other GP race promoters that Bernie was gonna call the shots. And he'd only given up one GP, not two to make his point. Next, 1976, here. Next, there we are. Uh, Peterson at the start leading Pole sitter Hunt into the first corner, but Hunt soon got past him for the lead on the ninth lap. Next. Gerald Donaldson wrote, Hunt won in convincing style, but there was great interest in Nicky Lauda, the leader of the world championship, in only his second race after his near fatal Nürburgring crash. He finished eighth behind Carlos Pache, who had a wild entanglement with Clay Rigazzoni in front of the pits, three laps from the end of the race. So Bernie Eccleston was the owner of the Braben team, which Pachi was driving for, and he protested Regazzoni for causing the crash. Uh, we thought that he was trying to just make trouble uh, with, for Regazzoni. Regazzoni uh, insisted on speaking only Italian in the stewards meeting. Uh, race stewards uh, function like referees. Uh, we ruled that it was just a racing incident based on this being a common occurrence, spinning out like this out of turn 10 and refused to give Bernie the satisfaction of having Regazzoni penalized. Next. 1977. Perhaps the negative image on the program cover was a sign of things to come for the Grand Prix at Mosport. Next. So Labatt's had already made the decision to go to another venue after this year, but this 1977 race's troubles would probably have meant that Mosport would have lost the event anyway. On Friday, Ian Ashley took off over the backstretch hump and landed heavily. It took quite a while to extract him, and the promised helicopter was not on hand. People were not happy. On Saturday, Jochen Maas crashed into the Arpco off the first turn and collapsed, collapsed, revealing rotten posts. That's the lower picture. On Sunday morning, James Hunt was driven around the track where he quizzed corner workers on their qualifications and experience, as if he might decide that they were not adequate and urged the drivers to boycott the event. Uh, finally, a little known fact, but known to the stewards, the telephone communication system was unreliable in the rainy conditions of the race day. Another reason to consider canceling that event. Next. Gilles Villeneuve, uh, who made his name in Formula Atlantic in Canada, had had a successful trial with McLaren at Silverstone earlier that year but they signed Patrick Tombe instead. Luckily for Villeneuve, he was signed by Ferrari to a full-time ride starting in 1978. They decided to start him in a third car for this Canadian Grand Prix. This would be his second F1 in his first race for Ferrari. Meanwhile, Lauda had clinched his 1977 championship as of the Watkins Glen the weekend before. And he was upset with Ferrari. He objected to them running a third car and on the Friday morning, he quit the team outright. Before the Canadian event, Ferrari lodged a protest against their own driver, Lauda, for failing to show up at Mosport. Uh, I don't know how a team can 
lodge a protest against their own driver, and that's the way the stewards saw it. They they didn't uh, they didn't uh, pay much attention to that protest. Villeneuve was running a ninth near the end of the race when he spun off an oil in turn nine and retired. He was credited with a 12th place finish and his maiden race for Ferrari. He had finished 11th in the McLaren at Silverstone. So that's him spun off in the lower picture. Next. During the race, Hunt had been running in second to Andretti in the Lotus 78, when the two of them come up to lap Moss, a, a Hunt's teammate. So the miscommunication between the two McLaren drivers saw Hunt colliding with Moss and crashing off the course at corner three. After he was helped out of the car by Marshal Ernie Strong, the volatile Hunt started to walk over towards the track when Moss was coming around again. Ernie reached out to constrain a presumably dazed Hunt from wandering out onto the track surface. Hunt responded by taking a swing and he knocked Ernie to the ground before coming to his senses and trying after the fact to make apologies. The stewards took this assault very seriously and they unanimously voted to levy the highest fine allowed by the FIA's yellow book, its rule book. Next. So after Andretti had led the first 78 laps of the 80 lap race in his Lotus 78, he dropped out with lack of oil pressure. Jody Schechter driving the Walter Wolf car in Canadian livery came through to win the race. Earlier in the year, Schechter had won for Wolf in Argentina and at Monaco. And despite seven retirements in the season, he finished second behind Lada in the championship standings. Next. If I had brought a program in 1977, I would have seen this announcement of the plans to move the race to exhibition place in Toronto the following year. In fact, this plan to move to the CNE failed to get Toronto City Council full approval, and Labatt's was left looking for an alternate location for the 1978 race. It only took one day after the Toronto Council vote for Montreal's Mayor Jean Drapeau to get on the phone to make a bid for the Grand Prix. Next. So the Grand Prix did move to Grand Montreal the next year and has run there ever since. In fact, at the 2017 running of the event, it was announced that in addition to the 18 million already committed by the city for facility improvements by 2019, the federal, provincial and city governments had promised support amounting to $98 million. Also, the contract with the Formula One group had been extended to at least 2029. Next. So Roger Pert, a CASC officer, was commissioned to build, to find a location for the new circuit, and the obvious choice was Ile Notre Dame, an artificial island built in the St. Lawrence, in the St. Lawrence River opposite the city as part of the site for the 1967 Expo 67. In addition, the rowing competitions of the 1976 Olympics had been held in the basin in the foreground. This location has proven to be an ideal one for the Canadian Grand Prix, and its long tenure here attests to that. This is without doubt the thing that Pert couldn't be most proud of in his years in auto racing. Next. Here's a map of the original circuit in 1978. They notice the location of the pits uh, to the right, just after the East Hairpin. Next. So here's the cover program cover with Andretti on the cover. He had already won the world championship in this revolutionary ground effects Lotus 1779 shown on the lower part of that cover. Next, here's the starting lineup for that 78 race. Jean-Pierre Jarier was brought in to replace Peterson after his fatal crash at Monza two races earlier. Andretti had already clinched the championship as of the Italian Grand Prix, but he was far off the pace here with an ill-handling car starting ninth in the grid. Villeneuve was third quickest and in the second row. Next. There's a second page to that. Notice that there's six drivers who did not get the start. Uh, they only allowed 22 starters, and so they had uh, pre-qualifying and uh, these drivers didn't couldn't get up to enough speed to to be among the top 22. 
next. In qualifying, it was Jerry in the Lotus Peterson, uh, in the Lotus that Lotus that Peterson would have driven, who starred by qualifying on pole ahead of Schechter and the hometown hero, Bill New. Jerry was easily able to lead into the first corner with Alan Jones and Williams jumping up to second after a brilliant start, dropping Schechter down to third. Notice in the lower picture, there were all the expo structures that were still in place at that time. Next. So there's Jerry at the top. He began to pull away and Jones suffered a slow puncture and dropped down the field as the race progressed, promoting Schechter in the lower picture to second and Villeneuve to third. Then Bell Villeneuve passed Schechter mid-race to take over second. Next. Jerry continued to dominate it until he retired with an oil leak as head Lotus driver and ready the year before at Mosport, leaving Villeneuve to take his first career win in his home race ahead of Schechter with Reutemann taking third. And then the crowd went wild. Here's another example of a race official risking his life unnecessarily. Next. Here's a painting that represents the unbelievable finish. This is may look like uh, it, it's correct, but it's not accurate. Uh, where, where's the pits there? Next. Here are the race results. Important part is Gio Villeneuve number one. Uh, only 12 uh, finishers or 10 more starters who were not qualified as finishers. Next. Here's Gilles Villeneuve on the podium with his arms raised. Way over in the left there, you can see Pierre Trudeau. And to his right, to Villeneuve's right, there's Schechter, who was to be Villeneuve's teammate at Ferrari the following year. Here's Gilles again, spraying beer. It's an exception to the rule that they always spray champagne, but Labatt uh, pulled up the fast one and got him to use the beer instead of champagne. That's his wife, Joanne, on the left. Next. Here's Villeneuve again uh, with uh, Mayor Jean Drapeau over his shoulder and Pierre Trudeau. Next. Here's a family shot of the, of the Villeneuve family taken after the race. Uh, on the left, that's his brother, Jacques, and then, it, then his wife, Joanne, then uh, Gilles, and there's his father and mother, and down in the front is a little kid. That's young Jack, who was, who was eventually to win the world championship. Next, there's a motorsport cover photo of Gilles in, in the race. Next, I like this picture, even though it's a composite, I think to me, it represents the iconic form this event was to take on from this time forward. Pete Lyons and his race report said, the Disney-esque victory of Bill New must have cemented the future of the GP in the minds of the Quebecois for many years to come. How true. The development of the circuit on Ile Notre Dame was the right track in the right place. Despite changing ideas of what F1 tracks should be like, this track has aged well over the years and Montreal has become a destination city for F1 fans. With Gilles Villeneuve's pocket or win in 1978 and his success in subsequent years, he has indeed made the Grand Prix of Montreal <clears throat> a great piece of Canada's heritage. Next. Skipping ahead. In 1986, CASC had signed a five-year contract with Labatt, extending it through 1991. However, an American, Jack Long, signed a six-year contract with Molson, a rival brewery who had already been sponsoring IndyCar racing in Canada. This impasse resulted in the 1987 Grand Prix being canceled. In October 1987, in Paris, the FIA stripped the CASC of its ASN status. That made the Labatt contract void uh, according to Terry Lovell in his book, Bernie's Game, Ecclestone then gave the FIA, via the FIA, 
arranged the setting up of what was effectively his own national sporting authority. The status of the Canadian ASN uh, is still questionable. It, it's a, an authority unto itself. And the new ASN was created by a fiat of the FIA and exists to today as a governing body answerable to no one within Canada. This cleared the way for Bernie to make a deal with Long and Molson for the Grand Prix to return in 88, without the CASC as a national unifying organization. The regions and the clubs declined as did involvement in truly Canadian auto racing activities. Next. During the hiatus year of 1987, a new complex of pits with the now Eau Courant garages attached was built in a location further to the west along the rowing basin. This has proven to be a much better arrangement and this pit hospitality complex has been upgraded over the years. Next. Here's a map from the 1988 program showing the new pit location. At first, the uh, pit exit rejoined our Knockwood Manor as, as seen in this drawing. It was, it's subsequently been reconfigured so the cars come back out from the pits and rejoin the track more smoothly on the outside of the second turn. Next. So that's my story of the early years of the 50 year history of the Canadian Grand Prix. Excellent, thank you so much, George. That was, that's a lot of history in, in 45 minutes. I, I really appreciate you putting that together. Uh, Dumeric, do we have any, any questions to start off? Not We've yet, got 10 minutes again, left here. I would, uh, I would invite everybody to uh, please fill in. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, let us know in the Q&A and we will ask them as soon as possible. Um, I'd start off with, with one of my own. Would you see the, it seems to be sort of a common trend in, in F1 racing in Canada that the weather is almost always bad. Would you say that's a, an unusual characteristic of Canadian F1 racing that it, it just seems, at least from the early years, it was always either raining or foggy or both. It was a problem with the calendar. When Watkins Glen got its date uh, for Grand Prix, the slot available on the calendar was the end of September, early October. And as you know, that's that you're starting into the fall. And you can have bad weather. When the Canadian, except for the first year, which ran in August, after that, it was paired with Watkins Glen. So it either ran just before or just after Watkins Glen. So we were stuck with that late September, early October. And the weather, I think, I can't remember if there was, I think there was only a drizzle. Uh, after a few years, they got that fixed and they moved the Grand Prix to a June date, which has uh, been the standard ever since. And so the weather in June, of course, is going to be better. Well, thank you. All right, we've got some questions coming in from the crowd. Um, Robert Bell would like to know, uh, what do you think is sort of the biggest changes for the better or for worse that have happened over the years since the very beginning of, of Canadian F1? Well, this is a very personal answer. F1, when I first was involved with it, and that was only a few, 10 years into the history of F1, was a people's sport. We all went there, and we camped, and we and we stood up by the fence and we shivered in the cold, but it was a popular uh, audience. Now it's dominated, it feels like it's dominated by big money and uh, people who can pay the big ticket price for the paddock club and so on. And, and that the common fan is kind of left by the wayside. On a, a related question, um, Jeff Fenwick is asking about sort of uh, hosting fees and wondering how in the early days when hosting fees weren't quite as massive as they are now, how did, uh, how did that work with sort of arranging a race? Did the circuit have to pay themselves or did F1, F1 sort of field some of the costs basically? 
Well, it, it was run on a much. It was it, it was run on a, a much more economical basis. There were if, if we talk about Europe, uh, which where most of the races were, they would have a truck, maybe a converted bus to take the car or a trailer to take the cars to the to the race. They would use the same mechanics, handful of mechanics that they used in the shop back at home at the race. So they would their their costs and they would they would sleep in in modest accommodation. Uh, all the costs were lower because the teams were getting very little money. So that the amount of money that had to be put up was relatively small. In those days, also, each team had to negotiate with each promoter for starting money. And it was it was small. So Bernie Ecclestone, one of his really big contribution was to organize the teams into a kind of a union. And they negotiated on block. And that's where that uh, missed race in 75 came from because he was starting to put the screws on them. And ever since, Bernie has worked, worked relentlessly to get the, the, the sanctioning fees up and up and up and up. And uh, that, that's really changed the whole nature of, of the financing. It's, it's made the teams much more wealthy, the drivers much more wealthy, Bernie much more wealthy, and so on. On a somewhat related note again, uh, Colleen wants to know sort of how you feel about the shift from using mostly kind of um, local officials to, to sort of dedicated national or regional personnel in, in the realm of stewards and scrutineers. How has that sort of changed, changed the game as it were? Well, when I was involved, it was almost by definition a kind of amateur sport. Uh, and at, at every level, uh, and the race officials were essentially amateurs. Uh, now, as time has gone has gone on, those amateur racers with uh, race officials with little experience gained more and more experience and became more professional in the way they did it. But my experience as a steward. Uh, it changed. It's changed totally now, where the stewards are uh, have a very long rule book, and are very organized. Have a lot of aids and are able to uh, see video everywhere. And if you want uh, decisions that are based on good information and a good experience, I think. I think. The way they're doing it now is 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 the only way. Um, Chris is asking about because you you didn't sort of bring it up directly, but it came up during the presentation that um, the first GPs were ninety laps, and then over time they dropped down to eighty, and I believe that's that's continued to drop. Would you be able to speak any to sort of why the the races got shorter generally? Was it because not many people were finishing, or I I think there's two reasons for that. Uh, one is, I think people have a shorter attention span. If you go back earlier than into the 50s, those races typically ran three hours or more. Uh, once they got into television, they wanted to be inside a two hour television window. And now for even back to Mon the early days in Montreal, that was a rule that the race could not run beyond two hours because of the television window. And, and now, so basically that's it, it's a two hour television window and, and they fit inside the television window. Uh, were they better when they were three and four hours? I don't know. I like, I think so, but I guess most people have a short attention span. Um, so not a question, but an interesting comment. Um... Harvey Hood's son is on the line, and he says in 1987, uh, when the sort of contract uh, impasse happened, apparently Harvey did have a contract, sort of a backup with Jack Long to, to stage the race if things 
did get resolved, which they didn't. But apparently there was something in place so that uh, theoretically the, the 1987 Grand Prix could have happened. Well, Nelson would know better than I. Thank you, Nelson. I, th I think we have time for a, a, one, one more. or two more questions. We have about two minutes left here before. Our, Type fast, folks. Uh, anything left? Uh, George, is there any, any, any last parting words uh, before we let you go this evening? Well, I want to reiterate the fact that when we raced, when the Grand Prix ran on most sport, it was kind of an amateur event. And uh, Nelson, who this, uh, to the contrary, uh, it was not a very professionally run event. And the safety measures at most sport were lacking and that's why it left there. Uh, that the race could not have continued um, in far into the future, uh, even if they had made a lot of upgrades uh, to the track in, after uh, they lost the race. Uh, when they went to Montreal, it was not perfect when they started, but they have found the money a lot. They've been able to raise money uh, from from all those government authorities, and they've been over the years. They continued to upgrade the quality of that facility, uh, the safety provisions, the grandstands, uh, and that is, you know, I think a world class, current state of the art uh, venue, and that's the reason why the Canadian Grand Prix has been able to continue um, successfully. Uh, had, had they gone to the CNE, I, it would not, it, it would have been a failure. Great. Well, thank you so much, George, for joining us. Thank you everyone actually for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, so just a reminder, our next talk is going to be the third Thursday in November. Uh, and we're gonna be going from the, the 1860s here, uh, sorry, from the 1960s back to the 1860s uh, with our next talk, uh, a wide range of talks this fall. Uh, as we talk about the first, uh, believed to be the first car to ever come to Canada. So thank you again. And uh, thank you, George. And look forward to seeing everyone again next month.